So, um, Yvette, I'm going to give you the microphone now. In fact, it's open. Please go ahead. Thanks, Ricardo. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming today. Um, so, Dr. Jan Angus is currently at the University of Toronto as an associate professor in the Faculty of Nursing. Her work focuses on the social and contextual forces that affect access to healthcare, particularly cardiac rehabilitation and cancer screening. Her interest in the exclusionary practices embedded in cardiovascular risk modification is informed by the work of social theorists such as Dorothy Smith and Pierre Bardia. She is also involved in an ongoing community-based participatory, participatory study investigating institutional and social challenges to cancer screening access for women with disabilities. Thanks, Jan, for joining us. You can go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Yvette. Now I will give the microphone to, to Jan. Jan, uh, so uh, just a second. Um, I will give you uh, the controls of the session now. Okay, Jan, you are you are unmuted, so you can speak now. Okay, that's great. Can you see the slides? Oh, yes, yes, we can see that okay. very well. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm sure everyone has uh, had a chance to look at the, the title slide. Um, I'd like to move on to um, my acknowledgments, um, and uh, they include... Um, they include, uh, first of all, uh, the Canadian Institute of uh, Health Research, which is a sponsor of the research that I'm going to talk about a little bit, but I'm, I'm more going to be focusing on um, the particulars of uh, using social theory um, as uh, we went through the movements of the study. Um, I'd also like to thank my research partners, uh, the New Women's College Hospital, Toronto Rehab um, Institute, and St. Michael's Hospital, um, they were in, involved in facilitating uh, the study that I'm going to speak about. Um, but most of all, I want to thank Atlas TI and the University of Alberta International Institutes for Qualitative Methods, um, who are the webinar sponsors, uh, for making this possible. It's a great honor to speak with you all today. Uh, Ricardo, thank you so very much for uh, being here to facilitate, because I have no idea what I would do without someone here to help with uh, uh, the, the mechanics of this, and Yvette, thank you for your kind introduction. So to move on, I want to start with a caveat or a proviso. Uh, first of all, um, I don't want in this session to advocate that social theory ought always to be used in qualitative research. Uh, there are some folks who, who actually think that we shouldn't be using theory at all in qualitative research. Um, and uh, that it, it might actually uh, bias or change our findings if we were to um, begin from a social theory. Um, I'm, I'm not going to take up that debate. That's not really what I want to do here. What I want to do is ask how can we use social theory to inform inquiry? And also, um, I, I think one of the backdrops of, of my discussion is, um, is, is this a framework? Is this something into which we're neatly fitting our data? Um, or are we using social theory as a lens through which we, we can view our data? So that's, that's kind of the caveat, that's the caution. Um, as you know, theory in qualitative research has been taken up by a number of authors, including Margaret Sandalowski, who wrote a number of years ago um, about uh, the different guises of uh, qualitative research, or of theory in qualitative research. And, um, and there is ongoing discussion and um, work on, on theory in qualitative research to this day. Um, we can um, actually build theory with qualitative research, and I think that's not news to anyone. Um, there is some debate about the use of induction in building theory, whether or not that's sufficient uh, just to work strictly from the data or from the ground up. But um, be that as it may, it's very important to consider uh, qualitative research as, as uh, uh, a theory uh, building enterprise. Um, but others like to draw on theory to help extend their interpretations to inspire fresh perspectives. Um, 
some of the authors that I've drawn on talk about plugging into or linking um, their data and, and their ideas with extant theories um, in research and in that way come up with something new and interesting. Um, there's also ongoing and continuous discussion that was begun by um, by Guga and, and Lincoln and continued by Denzen and, and colleagues um, about the paradigmatic positions uh, that um, actually inform and enhance uh, the intellectual coherence of our inquiries. And I think of paradigms as being um, very large meta-theories or philosophies about um, the knowledge building enterprise. And, and so this is another um, way that we can bring theory into the discussion. Um, but today I'm talking about social theory. And I, I, I think, first of all, want to begin from the opinion um, that social theory is not necessarily an object or a tool um, that we uh, apply at certain points and not others um, and take it as disconnected from the theorist who developed it. Um, so right off, one of the things I'm saying is that um, theory is, is not um, an entity unto itself. Uh, we actually need to, um, in social theory especially, um, because it is so often critical theory, um, take into consideration the theorist who is working um, with social ideas and understand their project from the beginning. Um, therefore we need to read theorists and think with the theorist as well as with the theory. So know where they come from. And the theory is integral to our thought during um, a project uh, from its conceptualization um, through the design process, data collection, analysis, and dissemination. It's very, very hard to drop it in and out of, of a project. Um, it's pretty much there, uh, whether or not we wish to admit it. Um, and so if, if theory is almost always there, and as Silverman says, we always start from somewhere, theoretically, or with our own background thoughts, um, there, there must be some ways that we can go about working from social theory. Especially in healthcare, um, social theory is important because health and uh, events around health are um, ultimately social. Um, people seek care from health providers. Um, they um, are in social situations with illness. So social theory is very useful and informative in, in this type of study. Um, and today, I, I want to work closely with the ideas of Howard Becker, who some time ago, I believe in 1998, published a book called Tricks of the Trade, How to Think About Your Research While You're Doing It. And um, I've often drawn on his ideas because um, he, he actually is someone who says, um, theory is a necessary evil in social research. It's something that, that we all have with us because we study theory, um, we, we read theory. Um, but there are individuals who worry um, that it can overshadow the inquiry, that it can take it over and, and actually run rampant with our ideas. And so Becker poses several uh, tricks or suggestions for uh, taming theory, as if theory is, is uh, a kind of a wild animal that's uh, somehow bound up with our cognitive processes. I, I tend to think otherwise. I, I think theory can be um, lively, but also um, our data can be a bit of a wild animal at times. Um, so Becker's book is divided into four um, fairly substantial chapters. One involves imagery, and he talks about the images a researcher or a theorist um, may bring to the inquiry. Um, so, so what do you come into a study with, even before you, you begin the work, before you even uh, design a study? What are some of the things you bring to you with it? And throughout the conduct of the study, what images um, are coming into play? Um, sampling is another chapter. And, and actually, in reading it, he's, he's talking more about design issues that may emanate from um, the topic, from um, the uh, research effort, and also from the theory itself. And so I'm, I'm going to think a little more broadly than simply sampling when I speak to this, uh, this part of uh, um, my presentation. 
then concepts, um, and, and he speaks to uh, the creation of concepts as well as the um, application or use of concepts, how concepts become defined and how they become empirically interpretable. Um, and then finally he speaks about logic and how um, we, we actually go forward coming up with uh, the, the main themes of our, our research from these concepts because after all research that simply reports concepts um, without looking at how they relate to one another and, and uh, what the central narrative ought to be um, isn't terribly interesting although there's a fair amount of it out there and it's very useful when you're doing a, a metasynthesis. So um, I'm, I'm going to be looking at these four areas um, and taking my own interpretations into it. If you want to read Becker's book, um, I really recommend it. It's very interesting and of course he's, uh, he's a, a real hand at uh, uh, doing research. He doesn't speak entirely about qualitative research either. He's, he's looking at research writ large. All right, a bit about me and what I bring in terms of imagery uh, to my research. I'm going to be talking a bit today about um, research involving cardiac rehabilitation. And um, you know, it was a study where we were looking at gender issues uh, to some extent, but we were also looking at how people struggle in the everyday to bring new, um, new um, uh, practices uh, into their, their existing repertoires of behavior. The idea of applying um, new exercise habits, weight loss, um, managing new um, medications, all of these things um, are very important and um, it, it really does take a lot I think for people to adopt new lifestyle patterns having uh, studied this um, in um, other inquiries in the past. Um, we were also interested in looking at how men and women change and how they, how they might differently approach it, um, but especially how comorbidity complicates the process. So how um, mixing health regimens um, can um, make it even more difficult to make uh, uh, changes for the purposes of cardiac risk modification. I'm interested in cardiac rehab um, and I'm, I'm also working from a background of data that I've kind of worked on for, for a long time, or a background of research uh, literature that um, basically says that attrition is a problem in some cardiac rehabilitation programs, and it tends to be higher among women in those programs. So the idea there is that people don't tend to stay for the entire program, they may drop out. And cardiac rehabilitation programs, as some of you may know, um, can actually tend to be um, uh, lengthy. They can be six months. Um, they can also involve uh, attendance at a facility, um, a hospital perhaps, or a separate uh, community re rehabilitation facility. Um, they, um, they can actually be very difficult for people to, to stay in. And so um, there is some concern about attrition in these programs. Many of them have um, uh, instituted changes based on attrition issues. Um, it's thought that women don't attend um, as, as long as they ought to because of their changing um, spheres of activity and there, there are many areas of involvement in their social worlds. They may have elder care issues or, or spousal care issues uh, to deal with. Um, they, many women are um, working and uh, in, in uh, their employment and um, still trying to attend and in fact by the time a person gets to cardiac rehabilitation after they've had uh, an MI for example or um, some kind of uh, therapy uh, such as surgery they, they may actually have resumed employment and this goes for both men and women so in fact their lives are complicated by starting cardiac rehabilitation. Um, others say that women's attrition could be um, associated with physiological dimensions of their health, uh, such as age at onset um, and the presence of comorbidity. Normally women are older than men um, when they uh, develop heart disease and that would mean that they might have problems such as arthritis. Um, but in looking at comorbidity, we were interested in diabetes because it's significantly related to um, program attrition in both men and women. Um, so both genders are affected 
And um, in fact, uh, there, there is um, a, a lot of complexity in managing diabetes as well as uh, the cardiac rehab program, although intuitively some of um, the, uh, the measures that should help one will be helpful in the other, such as exercise. So moving on, um, I've, I've talked a little bit about uh, you know, some of the, the imageries that I bring, um, I, that I know about. Um, and, and I also bring some of Bourdieu's imagery, so I'm going to speak uh, to his as well. But I also want to say that reflexively, I've, I've run the whole gamut in my career from uh, believing that people really ought to uh, make these health behavior changes to actually thinking that there may be something um, a little um, bent about the way that we're going about asking people to change. And so this study actually uh, resonated more with my, my later perspectives. Um, now, in terms of the idea of imagery, um, we, we draw on the imageries used by theorists to envision what there is to study, what we can focus on in the particular study, which of course um, runs a little counter to what Becker says. Um, you know, he says that uh, we need to be careful about how we allow um, uh, theory to overrun um, our uh, research interests. But, um, it, it really does help in studying a persistent unresolved problem uh, to take on a new theoretical perspective, to try and invert and, and change thinking um, you know, about that issue. And so that's what I hoped we would accomplish by um, drawing on Bourdieu and uh, social theory in general. Bourdieu has actually a, a, a somewhat metaphorical way of writing. And so when I say that we have to engage with uh, a theorist's work um, as, as much as possible and read that theorist's work, it, in some ways um, that is where you pick up the imageries, the metaphors that they see as important in, um, in their theoretical perspective. He says that the social world is embodied in a, a veritable language of distinctive signs. So that is bodies um, actually convey language um, and bodies converse um, uh, together in, in social situations. So people don't just uh, speak, they do. And the way they do can um, either reinforce or disrupt um, the congruity of, of the social world for one another. So one body actually can have a great deal of impact on other bodies and, and uh, their owners in terms of social positioning. So this is a very relational way of, of theorizing, but also a very physical one. Bourdieu also talks about practices, um, and, and much of his work is around trying to understand why people practice the way they do, why they have certain repertoires of behavior that, um, while they may not necessarily be predictable, um, they they um, indicate some dispositions to behave in specific ways. And he says that there's actually a non-monetary economy of practices um, wherein exchanges and reciprocities of, of uh, gestures are fundamental to social position and continuity. And if we think about this, and I, I want you to hang on to this particular image as, as I go through my discussion. If you think about this, um, in a social situation, for example, a classroom, um, you know, we see that people um, act pretty much the way they're supposed to. The student's behavior may reinforce the, the professor's uh, position, but also um, the professor has tasks to do in order to maintain um, their position as well. Um, people use certain areas of a classroom um, in uh, specific ways. You rarely see a student going up to the front of the class while a prof is, is uh, teaching, unless, of course, they've been invited to. Things are very different if the classroom involves a, a small group seminar, of course. So, you know, we, we actually, by observing and not listening, um, can learn a great deal about social situations. One social situation that um, I draw your attention to is that of eating and the significance that food um, holds in, in our social worlds. And actually one of the students who was linked with um, the, the study I'm talking about um, did um, an analysis of eating practices and, and food and, and how um, these, uh, these issues really um, enter into people's attempts to change. And what I'd like to show you here is a picture of a hostess at a dinner party. And, 
Um, we see that she is taking great care to um, provide a lovely table. There's flowers on the table. There's attractively served food. There's wonderful wines, presumably. And again, one of Bourdieu's ideas is that of taste and, and how there's an embodiment of social position within the, the uh, foods and um, uh, consumables uh, that we have taste for. Uh, so certain fine wines uh, may show that we occupy a, a particular social position. But this cook hostess has uh, prepared a meal and she's being recognized by uh, her guests as uh, someone who has given them great pleasure by offering this food. And um, you know, we see here that there's a, a powerful sociability around the table, uh, around food offering and food acceptance. There is definitely a reciprocity um, in this scene. Another scene here is, is a birthday party, and I don't know if you can see um, in the foreground there's a birthday cake, and this is an older woman. Um, I think I, I'm beginning to uh, identify with her, um, and she's presumably uh, celebrating an important birthday, and she has her family around her, and the food, the cake, is, is meant to, um, to demonstrate celebration, uh, to show that she is... is uh, cared about and that the family is is glad that uh, they can be with her on her birthday. They're all going to share the cake. Um, and there are gifts too, and there's in Bourdieu's work, uh, those of you who have, who have uh, read any of Bourdieu's uh, papers may be familiar with um, his ideas around gift exchange and how that's an important part of the social world. So these gestures, these gestures of celebration, these gestures of food sharing are, are a part of that bodily uh, conversation. And we see a tremendous social cohesion and coherence around the predictability of these events. And this becomes um, all the more um, enticing when we see what happens when things don't go as they should with food. And, um, food actually can be used in transgressive ways. Now I've got, I'm hoping that this, um, this video will show. Um, you have to pay attention and watch very closely because this is Bill Gates. He's entering a building. Um, you see behind him there's a, a kind of a wall or pillar. So watch quickly because this happens very quickly and uh, I, I, uh, I'll speak about it after. So someone has hit um, Bill Gates in the face with a pie, and um, you know again it happens quickly, and there seems to be some confusion around uh, things being filmed. Um, but this is a transgression. This is an act of resistance of some sort. We we do see uh, the use of this particular gesture um, on occasion with politicians as well, and it's it's meant to uh, demonstrate a, a kind of a, a disrespect, uh, a positioning of uh, this particular person in the eyes of the pie thrower. Um, and you know, there, this is used as a humorous device too, but here it's, it's definitely an act of social positioning. So just as the cake in the birthday party was used as um, an item where a person was positioned as someone who was valued and loved, and in the uh, dinner party food was used to demonstrate to guests that they were valued and loved. Um, Bill Gates is being shown here that he isn't necessarily um, respected by the pie thrower. Um, so again, it's, it's these gestures, the, the movement of bodies in predict predictable and unpredictable ways um, that, um, that definitely uh, constitute a, a kind of a social imagery in Bourdieu's work. He calls this, this predictable um, disposition to act habitus. It's, it's a part of a person's um, embodied enactment of their social position. And it's very important to, to keep this one in, in, uh, in mind when, when we move through um, other steps in this, uh, this study that I'm talking about. So now moving on to sampling and design, um, as per uh, Becker's book, um, he, Bourdieu talks about his, his work in, in places, and, and Bourdieu only very grudgingly gives us uh, tips on how he designs studies and, and what he needs to do. Um, but in, in um, uh, The Weight of the World, uh, the final chapter, Understanding, which is also um, a reprint of a paper that was published uh, some time ago, um, he does give some, some of his thoughts about interviewing, um, about how uh, we can go about um, doing our research in thoughtful and reflexive ways. 
and he talks about realist construction. He says that phenomena, um, as, as many of the realists uh, do, exist independent of our knowledge of them. Therefore, it's very tricky to, to actually find out um, more about them because we, we kind of have these boundaries around our understanding and what we can see. And this also poses a problem for interviews. They may actually be a, a failed project. Um, and uh, there, there are some others, including um, Jackson and um, Nazai, who I've, I've indicated on a bibliography that appears at the end of this presentation, um, who say an interview can be a problem because participants' representations um, can't necessarily be taken at face value. Um, in, in fact, if, if we can um, not fully know um, uh, the, the nature of certain phenomena, uh, then there's only so much that participants can tell us. So there is a need for some kind of interpretive leverage, um, and, and this leverage in the form of theory, um, I propose, has to be reflexively applied. We have to be extremely thoughtful about it, and Bourdieu was uh, quite a stickler on reflexivity. Um, and, and the common concern is that theories can lead to a focus on what ought to be sampled in the data um, and uh, cause us to go about uh, an exercise of cherry picking, which probably is not going to be terribly productive in terms of new information. Um, ultimately, uh, Bourdieu says that um, if, if we're not attentive to this, this uh, reflexive enterprise and this uh, um, uh, I guess restraint of, of the temptation to focus on what we think we want to see, um, research can perpetuate a sort of symbolic violence. Um, and it, it can impose, first of all, the researcher's schemas on participants. That is, the researcher can take their own explanations um, over those of participants and do violence to their own uh, needs and their own um, representations of the world but also that participants can be uh, already involved in some forms of symbolic violence and um, may have limits on what they can say um, as, as a result of this. So um, all this you know, is, is just one way of, of uh, getting into the idea that in cardiac rehab, um, we are dealing with people who have already been indoctrinated into a certain set of discourses, um, neoliberal uh, potentially, um, that are telling them that they need to change, that they, um, they possibly have been, um, uh, I guess, complicit in uh, their own health issues because of lifestyle habits they've pursued in the past, and that they require um, a major overhaul in, in the way that they uh, approach their, their lifestyle. And so one of the, the men that we interviewed ultimately for our study um, actually had deeply absorbed this. He said that he had a lot of trouble making these changes, uh, being quote unquote motivated, which is uh, what many studies tend to focus on, is whether or not people have sufficient motivation or um, have emotional issues that prevent them from um, engaging wholeheartedly in change. And this man said that, that he talked to him, himself very severely at times, you know, saying to himself things like, hey, don't be a wimp, man up. Uh, you know, you've got to get your act together um, and, and change. And he calls himself more like a, a teenager than a man. So, you know, in some ways he's absorbed this position, this, this uh, discourse. Um, and, you know, is, is being very hard on himself. And this is something that we did see often in men, actually. There was, there was this man up um, discourse that they, they took on. Um, and, and yet this was a man who was uh, working in uh, a fairly um, time-consuming uh, area of work. He was a building superintendent. Um, and so uh, tenants would, would actually uh, be after him at, at various times in the day to help them with problems with their apartments. Um, he was divorced um, and he had a young child. He was only 53 years old um, and he'd already had three heart attacks, uh, three MIs, and he'd had diabetes for quite some time. So this was somebody who had major struggles. and. Um, he talked about the absence of a partner, someone who would um, assist him, as, as if it were a kind of a capital, that married people or partnered people had this form of capital, this support, 
this help. And um, he longed for it himself because love was a part of it, but also this idea that there would be somebody to prepare meals for him um, and and uh, take his part in, in uh, this, this enterprise of, of lifestyle change. Another man kind of echoed this. He was... Um, he was retired and he was also a widower and he spoke about his wife having done all of the cooking um, over the years and he himself didn't know how to cook and so suddenly he was confronted uh, with the problem of having to not only change his diet but to learn how to cook and understand uh, the rudiments of meal preparation. So, you know, these, these are some of the, the questions and problems uh, that people spoke about that made us see that it was necessary for us to try and um, move beyond uh, their representations, um, especially those that had already been uh, shaped by certain social discourses, and um, look at what was going on around them, understand um, their, their um, everyday circumstances, uh, so that we knew a little bit about um, what forces were shaping their activities. So next, Becker, um, is concerned with concepts and essentially one of the questions he asks is what comes first the concept or the theory um, in other words um, you know Bourdieu's concepts and theories originated in his fieldwork he developed his theoretical positions uh, through doing rigorous fieldwork at various points in his career and he wasn't necessarily always an ethnographer although a lot of his most famous work was ethnographic he also did um, uh, some quantitative work as well. So he was uh, fairly pluralistic, especially um, at certain points. Um, and, you know, he learned, and I'm not going to go into definitions of these, these concepts, from his fieldwork that practice, what people do, and um, the, the peculiarities of this conversation between bodies, this relational um, um, embodiment of the social world, um, is shaped by what he calls field, habitus, and capital. And so uh, field being the context or locations in which people um, are, are active. Habitus, as I said, is, is kind of an embodiment of dispositions to act in certain ways. And, and these are enfolded uh, relationally with the habitus of other people. There, there really um, is a, a kind of a sense that from Borgia's work that habitus is something that is around people's positions and they learn to act and behave in certain ways um, because of uh, the social positions in which they find themselves. And capital, of course, being resources that people draw on um, in order to secure a position within a field. So that's, that's a quick and dirty definition. I'm not going to go too much further than that for the sake of time. Um, but now, in, in terms of what comes first, there were some accusations of determinism. Um, people said that um, Bourdieu's uh, ideas about practice kind of uh, formed a, a, a black box that people couldn't get out of. Um, it, was, it was very deterministic in that uh, field habitus and capital um, essentially positioned people and they couldn't get out of those positions. They, they were continually complicit in reproducing their, their social places. Um, but his later work focused on social suffering and situations where habitual patterns no longer sufficed for people. In other words, where they found themselves in new fields, new places, where suddenly their rules of behavior that they had learned and, and had um, absorbed didn't fit anymore and um, didn't help them. And in fact, that's sort of what cardiac rehabilitation is. It's a, a, a time in people's lives where they suddenly need to change or feel they need to change, and uh, previous repertoires of behavior don't help. Um, tastes that they have developed over time, perhaps a taste for um, uh, rich desserts or, or whatever, um, don't serve them well um, when they need to get their diabetes under control and uh, try to uh, engage in uh, rehabilitation practices. What Becker says about this is that we can work with uh, Bourdieu's theories, concepts, and ideas, but it would be most useful to let the case define the concept. So look closely at the data, see what is going on in the data, and, and begin to develop our own concepts, and then see how um, the theorist's work might be 
or the theorist's ideas might be active uh, within those data or might not, you know, and that's another thing we need to be prepared for is, is not to find anything that resonates with uh, uh, the theoretical foundations that we're working from. So we actually um, need next to interrogate a concept once we've developed it using the theory to, again, leverage our thinking into something a little more interesting. So <clears throat> what I'm, I'm not going to go through the findings of the study because, um, you know, again, in the interest of time, I'm trying to do several things at once. But um, one of the, the concepts that we um, arrived at when we were looking at some of the tactics that people used um, was was the notion of concealment. People hid things. Um, they wanted to hide things. They felt conspicuous. And so we saw people um, testing their blood sugars in private, taking uh, nitroglycerin spray in private when they had angina, um, trying not to uh, take too much time off work um, to go to cardiac rehab, for example, um, and and really making an effort to resume um, their usual activities uh, in, in the home sphere. Um, and so um, one woman actually who was employed said it, said it this way. She said, you don't want to get a reputation of someone that's gone a lot of time because they're ill. It's harder for you to put yourself forward for anything. And opportunities that, that come up in the future, you know, um, they might say she's gone two or three days a week for this, or she's at doctor's appointments, or she's doing that. She felt that employers were looking at that. They were um, looking very closely at her capacity to enact the habitus of um, the reliable employee. And that um, being a relatively younger woman, um, she was in her mid-50s, uh, she would lose her um, opportunity to, um, to be promoted um, if, if she persisted in, in illness-related behaviors at work. Um, but she also spoke to how when she became ill first, her first MI or, or heart attack actually happened at work. Um, and uh, so there was, there was a bit of a production, she said, around getting her out. They had to call uh, an ambulance. There was no elevator. They had to take her downstairs. And she worked in a school, and so the children had to be kept in an assembly hall um, so that they wouldn't be... Uh, they wouldn't be let out of the assembly and become upset by uh, what had happened to her. So, you know, she already was working against this spectacular disruption of the social world. The routines of the school were, were completely blown apart by, by her first illness, and she didn't want to be um, uh, conspicuous uh, from there on in. So that was, that was one idea of concealment. There was that sense that there was something her body was supposed to be able to do, and she didn't want to uh, disrupt that. But this didn't just happen in the workplace. Um, another woman uh, who was retired um, um, actually used her nitro spray in uh, her nitroglycerin spray for angina in private so that her husband uh, wouldn't know uh, that she was using it. And um, there, there were some men actually who did similar things because they didn't want to frighten their wives. And some men actually downplayed their illness to wives, um, saying, you know, everything's going to be okay, don't worry, don't get upset. Um, and they, they downplayed their own sense of, of uh, disquiet about illness. This woman simply wanted to be able to go out. She might still have angina, but she wanted to go shopping or to go downtown. But again, she had a protective spouse who really wanted her to stay. So this notion of concealment was really around a, a kind of a reinstatement of one's social position. Um, and uh, we, we kind of you know, really worked on that as well as other um, uh, tactics that people used as, as ways of folding into existing social uh, positions that people occupied and, and returning to them. Now, just quickly, logics, um, I'm, I'm mindful of the time and I don't want to take too much longer. Um, we, in, in, um, in Becker's schema, he, he says that logics are really around the further interrogation of the data to crystallize the major premises or themes um, of the analysis. So once we um, have our concepts in place, um, what is the backstory? What what is actually going on here, and how do we want to present these uh, uh, findings 
to um, to others in um, in our spheres. So uh, some of the strategies that Becker uh, suggests, and, and there are many, so I'm only uh, giving a few. And these may be um, actually familiar to some of you who've done qualitative analysis before. Um, developing typologies of experience, so um, grouping participants in terms of uh, their um, similarities and differences. Um, finding disconfirming cases that, that might disrupt uh, this unfolding sense of a major premise to a study. And also comparisons. All of these um, help us move data out of um, you know, this, this sense of being uh, boxed in by our inability to see a phenomenon in its entirety um, because we can piece it together a little more uh, readily by, by looking at um, these particular strategies. Again, the question is what are some new approaches to this data, to this recurrent theme of um, attrition from cardiac rehab? Um, how can we creatively but usefully interpret our findings? And um, retroduction or abduction are um, other ways of, of logically um, building theory or drawing on theory or, or um, putting together our stories and our findings um, besides uh, induction. And uh, retroduction or abduct, uh, abduction often will draw on theory um, as, as a way of moving things from uh, what is apparent in the data to what this might be telling us about the social world. How is the social world shaped? Um, what would it have to look like in order for these, um, these findings to be in place? So we're really um, asking you know, what could be going on and then seeking further cases that will um, help us understand it. And you know, this is a tough one um, to, to quickly uh, give you an example, but um, we began to see uh, partway through the study that cardiac rehabilitation providers had a goal of risk modification. They wanted to reduce mortality um, and um, in, improve uh, the healthiness of, or in the sense of well-being in people that uh, attended their programs. And they knew how to do it in certain ways. Uh, they knew that weight loss, exercise, dietary change were important uh, for, for maintaining cardiovascular health. And um, indeed, there are studies that have, have shown that mortality um, is less in people who complete and uh, cardiovascular rehab programs and adhere, quote unquote, adhere, there's a whole other discourse there, to um, the suggested behaviors. But, oh dear, I've, I've gone and uh, tipped my hand. But our cardiac rehabilitation participants um, were, were more interested in reinstating that pre-reflexive sense of comfort. In fact, it seemed to us that they were trying to move back towards a sense of habitus, you know, moving back to that uh, ability to move effortlessly through their social worlds and um, begin to... Um, I guess practice in the ways they did before. There's there's always that sense that we want to return to normal, and, and people would talk about that that theme over and over. And in fact, there was this kind of nostalgia for a, a, a world of comfort rather than one where things had to be reflexively thought out. So we began to conclude that the main task of cardiac rehab programs should be to restore habitus. Um, so that's our idea of, of rehab. Um, and work with participants to achieve new levels of social comfort um, as well as physical um, health. And in fact, um, we, we began to see that cardiac rehab programs were unintentionally um, uh, ignoring social comfort and, and uh, some of uh, the social needs of participants, especially those who, because of uh, their cardiac health, had lost work, um, had um, incomes that were um, diminished, had um, begun to um, experience some discord within their, their family lives over things like diet, over things like exercise. The tensions that arose in their lives were many. Um, and so, you know, there, there needed to be some kind of a, a, a safety uh, net to, to catch them in, in that time of profound discomfort that occurred not too long after 
um, they, they have had uh, cardiac problems, um, such as an MI or um, uh, heart surgery. We found that typologies of experience weren't cleanly divided along gender lines, um, but the patterns did involve some component of, of gender. Um, and, and actually, um, Cheryl Pritlove, uh, who was uh, one of the doctoral students who uh, was a part of the research team, um, talked a bit about gender repair and, and how um, people actually sought to uh, restore their sense of gender competency. They were practicing as a man or a woman. Um, and, you know, and that may have been another reason why people tended to backslide and, and go back to their old behaviors. So um, it, it was a way that people found a mechanism for restoring habitus um, on their own. And because cardiac rehab could involve some tensions um, in people's home lives or discomforts in their working lives, um, there, there could be some encroachment on gender relations with others. So, um, you know, again, there, there were ripplings and disturbances uh, throughout people's social worlds um, that indicated to us that um, even changing one person's um, uh, sense of comfort and, and their way of entering into that embodied conversation um, could uh, create discomforts for others. So an unintentional outcome of cardiac rehab uh, can be struggles over social meanings um, of certain practices and indeed a form of symbolic violence um, among those who don't have the resources to make the changes easily and that can involve resources such as education, resources such as financial capital or even time. Um, and these are all things that are required um, to comfortably uh, engage in cardiac rehabilitation. Um, so I hope what I've been able to do is uh, to introduce you to ways of thinking with theories and theorists uh, to advance qualitative inquiry. I believe I've scratched the surface, but I don't know if there are questions. So um, I guess, uh, Ricardo, you've been keeping track of that. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jan. So let's see. Um, we have one question, and I'm going to give the microphone to the person who wants to ask it. And, and let's, let me see the, her name. She is Jude. So let me see if, if you have a working microphone, Jude. Uh, just a second. Okay, the microphone is open. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, yes, go Jen. Ahead. Jen, I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation and uh, while I was listening, I was doing a quick um, lit search of some of the literature that you were referring to and I would really appreciate um, some citations for around this work that you've been reporting and in particular um, when you were talking to the slide of the picture of the hostess um, you were talking about a colleague of yours who had done work on the role of food and eating and behavior change Right. And I would love it to, to be able to follow up on those um, references. Okay, so that was Marnie uh, Kramer Kyle Keeley, um, who is a doctoral student at, at our faculty. And um, she uh, did her dissertation based on that analysis. Um, now, it has not yet been published. I'm going to go right here. Um, it has not yet been published. It's, it's uh, going to be, uh, there is a paper that's um, about ready for review. Um, and so um, I don't know if there's a way I can update you on that. Oh, well, um, dissertations. If it is, the, is the dissertation submitted? Cause yes, actually could it, ask it. Yeah. it's at the University of Toronto Library. Um, wait till I see if I can fish out the title for you. Um, it, was, it was titled Diet Projects. A study of cardiac rehabilitation participants engaged in changing dietary practices. Thank you. Well, I hope you can find it, but get in touch with me by all means if you can, and I'll see if I can um, help you with it. Okay, thank um, you. Yeah, uh, uh, yep. uh, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, um, I'm wondering if you would be willing to share your email because certainly I'd love to uh, read some of your writings around this area. Oh, of course. So it's uh, jan.angus, A-N-G-U-S, at 
uh, utoronto.ca. So that's U-T-O-R-O-N-T-O dot C-A. Thank you. Uh, okay, there is another question from Nikki, and I will give the microphone to Nikki. Uh, let me see. Go ahead, Nikki okay. Perry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, John, you talked a lot about, uh, well, particularly in logics, which sort of resonated with grounded theory. And I was just wondering, am I right in thinking that your research study was grounded theory? I'm sorry, could you... Um... The last part of your question was, uh, are you right in assuming that this study was grounded theory? Yes. No, um, in fact, um, it was. It drew more on the logics of ethnography, although we didn't do an observation. Um, it was um, mainly an interview study. Um, I didn't use all of uh, the grounded theory, um, I guess, strategy. Um, and instead, I, I was, uh, you know, initially um, drawing on some of the writings of Hammersley and Atkinson in terms of uh, data analysis. Mm -hmm. But um, my my interest wasn't in developing a theory. My interest was in um, working with a theorist uh, and a theorist's ideas to leverage a different interpretation. A lot of people have used grounded theory in this area however, and, and I think it's a, a worthy strategy. It's just that um, it isn't that easy to use um, a, an extant theory when you're, you're trying to build a grounded theory, if you know what I mean. I do know that some folks have worked with grounded theory strategies and have initially, um, you know, as, as Becker recommends, uh, developed their, their uh, concepts from the data and then begun to look at how um, a theory might uh, further elaborate on those concepts. But that's not what I chose to do necessarily. Thank you. Okay, Th thank you both of you. Um, I do not have any more written questions. However, there is the hand raised of someone. Her, uh, her or his name is uh, Dehere. Dehere. Uh, could you, um, if you have a working microphone, uh, could you ask your question? Your hand is raised. Okay, there is no question. And let me see anything else written. Uh, no, nothing more written here. Um, so we still have a few minutes left. If anybody would like to ask a question, please feel free to do so. Okay, we do not have more questions. So I would like to ask um, Yvette if you have any announcements um, of activities uh, related to the IIQM. Uh, do you have anything to, to announce for uh, to us? Um, just that our next Masterclass webinar series will be on March 20th at 1 o'clock p.m. Mountain Standard Time, and that will be Martin Hammersley. We'll hopefully have his information up uh, next week on the site for everyone to register. And then also just to check out our website, iiqm.ualberta.ca, we've got our TQ and AQM um, events that are coming up in June. So the TQ Thinking Qualitatively Workshop Series and the Advances in Qualitative Methods Conference. So abstract submission for both is open for another two weeks. Um, so you can hurry in and get your abstracts in. And hopefully we'll see you in June. Thank you very much, Yvette. Now, there is another question that just came, uh, came in. Uh, Sarah, I will give you the microphone. Sarah Beckert. Well, the question by Sarah is the following. A recommended starter text for Bourdieu. Would you recommend any uh, any text from the author? Oh, um, <clears throat> well, that's that's a really good question. Um, uh, I think one of the things with Bourdieu is that he, he wrote more clearly um, as his career progressed. Um, and so while some people might suggest you uh, start with um, you know, some of his uh, earlier works and kind of follow his, his thinking, um, I've, I've often recommended um, Practical Reason, um, which is uh, one of his more recent books. Um, Practical Reason on the Theory of Action. 
Uh, it's a 1998 Polity Press uh, book um, because he, he actually does um, uh, go over a lot of his uh, previous ideas and discuss them, but it's, um, I think, a, an easier start. He also has written um, articles about, um, you know, his different ideas around um, capital um, and um, other of his, his uh, theoretical constructs, but um, one of the, the more important books, I think, is uh, Outline of a Theory of Practice, where he kind of looks at um, uh, the scholarship on which he bases his own work and then uh, moves forward. So I think that's an important one, too. Thank you. It's written a tremendous amount, so <laughs> you yeah. can't really go wrong. Just go take something off the shelf. Um, and, um, yeah, I think that would be a good start. I, I won't push it any further. Okay. Uh, there is a, a question that is uh, related to that. I'm going to give the microphone to Clara. Uh, Clara, would you like to speak? Yes, I I would like to know if uh, Dr. Jan have another research related with hell with Wordian's theory. Um, yes, I do. Um, I, I've got a few actually where I've drawn on some of Wordian's ideas. Um, you know, it's terrible that I can't cite myself here, but I cannot often remember. I think I may actually have one of my papers here. No. Um, if you want, uh, you can send that to me, and I can oh, forward yeah, that to everybody. Yeah, there's one in um, qualitative health research, and it's um, ha uh, stress and habitus, something around around those uh, those ideas. So um, you might be able to find it there just by taking my name and, and uh, searching that way. But I will send it to you, Ricardo. Okay, thank you. Let me give the microphone to Francis. Your hand is raised, and we have one minute left. One minute left. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay, thank you. I just wondered if you had a reference for your cardiac rehab study um, that you mentioned where you had identified the goals of the providers versus the goals of the participants. Um, that, that I'm still working on that paper, so it's going to be going to be fairly soon. Okay. It's a recently completed study, and that's why it's not uh, it's not out there. Can you comment on how Dorothy Smith has, has influenced your research? Karen asked. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, Dorothy Smith is uh, really works for more of a materialist foundation, um, which is similar to um, our realist foundation, um, but her ideas um, have have greatly influenced me in that she. Um, is concerned with the notion of theory um, as something that may shape um, what can be known in the social world. And especially she began it, uh, with a feminist critique um, that, um, you know, essentially said sociology was based on um, more masculine uh, views of the world and that women's knowledge um, had been somewhat left out. Um, that's fairly similar in some ways to Bourdieu's ideas of uh, symbolic violence. But, um, you know, I think probably the difference between the two would be that Smith would be somewhat suspicious of um, my efforts to work with a particular theory while I was doing research. So, um, you know, I have to admit that, um, you know, Smith might part company with what I was doing. So thank you very much, uh, Jan, for, for your answers and, of course, for your presentation. And I want to thank everyone. Uh, some of you, well, I mean, people coming from so many different countries uh, to support uh, this, this, this project. Uh, we've been doing this for already a year. We are now into our second year of this webinar series on qualitative methodology. And uh, your support is essential for this to work well. So thank you very much, all of you, for having joined us. Thank you, Jan, for, for sharing your, your, your knowledge and, and your, your experience with us. And thank you, Yvette, also from IIQM. You will be receiving uh, by email uh, a message uh, with a link to an evaluation form. Uh, so if you could uh, take a few minutes to complete that. And also the link to the website from where you will be able to uh, uh, watch the recording of this presentation 
And I believe that the PowerPoint uh, will be there as well. Uh, we have all of the PowerPoints of, the, of, of, of our presentations on that website. So thank you, everyone. And I hope to see all of you uh, again uh, in our next uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Goodbye, uh, Jan, and goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, bye -bye. Ricardo. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.